Hey guys, welcome back to Hoffman Reproductions and thank you for tuning in with us again today. It occurred to me a while back, although many of our subscribers are probably no strangers to muzzleloaders and more specifically flintlocks because that's what we mainly deal, deal with here on this channel. There is probably a portion of our viewing audience that have little to no experience with them. So on this video and probably the next several to follow, we're going to be discussing all the ins and outs of these, about the best place to purchase one if you want to get into it, uh, the various loading tools and accoutrements needed, how to properly load and fire them step by step, and then ending with the best way to go about cleaning them and putting them up for storage. This is a subject that's been covered in other videos if you watch a uh, shooting type channel and they're all involved in black powder shooting they have probably covered this subject but each uh, channel covers them in a little bit different fashion and I always find them interesting because there's always new insights and uh, always new little tricks and tips if you will that uh, further help further your knowledge so that's what we hope to do here today so let's say you're brand new to muzzle loading, maybe you don't even own one, and you are looking to get into it. So the first thing you're going to have to do, obviously, is purchase a firearm. Now, before you just dive in to see if there's any water in the swimming pool, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. First one is, what specifically are you wanting to do with a muzzle loading firearm? In other words, are you primarily wanting to hunt with it? Are you wanting to hunt small game, big game? Uh, is there a certain historical time period that interests you and likewise you want your firearm to follow suit with that? Are you wanting to get involved in historical reenacting? Uh, what your budget is? These are all things that are going to dictate what type of firearm you purchase. And obviously you could spend a, a small amount of money or you can spend a large amount of money. It's uh, all dictates on those first few questions that hopefully you've been swirling around in your mind if you're thinking of buying one of these. So after you've zeroed in on a specific type that you're looking for or historical background, uh, the next avenue that you need to go is where you're going to purchase your firearm from. And we are going to be covering flintlocks in today's video. It's primarily what we deal with. That's where my main interest lies. So you percussion guys, uh, be patient. But uh, today, flintlocks. So if you want to buy one, there's a few different ways that you can go about doing that. The easiest and probably the cheapest is to get a commercially made flintlock. Uh, there's a couple of companies that are importing them into the U.S. and several that are based here in the U.S. Traditions offers a few different types of flintlock or Kentucky rifles. They're sort of an entry level. Um, the Italian manufacturer Petersoli, they probably hold the bulk of the market as far as production flintlocks go here in the United States. And they offer about half a dozen different military pattern muskets um, from the Revolutionary War time period up until the uh, War of 1812 and they also offer several different types of Kentucky styled rifles. Um, that's the avenue a lot of people go when they first get into it because they're relatively easy to obtain. Um, Petersoli has gotten much more expensive than it used to be but it's nowhere near the price of a custom made firearm so that's uh, the level that a lot of people often enter into. And not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, Petersoli builds a fine gun. And out of the box you can take it and start enjoy flintlock shooting with little to no trouble. The only thing is as your taste refines as it is, if you get more involved in a, a certain historical impression, the production guns start to lose their appeal because they don't quite have the uh, finish, fit, and look of an authentic firearm. Not that they're um, inferior guns, they're not. They're good quality. You, you'd be happy with it, you know, to, to get involved with flintlock shooting, but they're not quite on the same level as a custom made or a period correct type flintlock. Uh, another avenue that you can go and 
I'm kind of reluctant to say this because I don't want to open a can of worms, but there are also the India imported muskets. Um, some guys are huge fans of them. Some guys won't touch them with a 10-foot pole for various reasons. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation floating around out there on the internet. Myself, personally, I'm a fan of them because it's a way to get someone involved in history and flintlock shooting that maybe is on a budget because their firearms are cheaper. cheaper excuse me. There's a couple of importers here in the U.S. Um, the one that I'm familiar with and have used quite a bit is Loyalist Arms. They're actually not in uh, the U.S., but they're in Nova Scotia right across the border there. And one thing I would give them they have an edge on is they offer a wide variety of muskets. A lot of uh, match lock, wheel lock, and then French, English, and I believe German military muskets. So they have a broad array to choose from, and they are much, much cheaper. Now you have to compare apples to apples. No, those India imports are not going to be on the same plateau as a Petter Soli, but they'll give you a good quality functioning firearm. Um, you may want to do some work on it. You might want to rework the finish on the metal and the stock for a more authentic look, but if you're wanting to get into it, you don't quite have the money for the more premium guns as far as commercially, uh, it is indeed an option. And again, there's all kind of opinions on those. I personally built over nine of them with parts purchased through Loyalist Arms from India, and I have been happy with them. If you go that route, uh, Blair and Linda Higgins, the owners, if you would have any type of an issue, they're right there to work it out and uh, make things right for you. So that is also an option if you're wanting to get into it, but don't quite have the money for the more premium commercially available guns. The next step up in the avenue of fine flintlock firearms would be a semi-custom kit. Now those are available from several manufacturers nowadays. Uh, you can get them through the rifle shop, you can get them through uh, Kwood Arms, you can get them through Track of the Wolf, and uh, Jim Chambers offers flintlock kits. This happens to be a Jim Chambers flintlock kit that I've had for over 20 years. And the newest one on the block, uh, Kibler Long Rifles, also Tennessee Valley Muzzle Loading, all offer semi-custom parts kits. And it's really cool because if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you can buy those and actually build it yourself. Uh, the various kits require various skill levels. You might want to buy the parts and then have a gunsmith assemble it. But as far as uh, an option, that is a little more pricey because you're paying for premium parts. And the more expensive the parts are, it's generally going to give you a better flintlock. So that's something to consider and you can end up with a very period correct and good functioning firearm going that way. As far as my recommendation for parts kits, those are all excellent choices. You'd be happy with any of those. My personal experience, the best on the market currently is the Kibblers. He is offering a Southern Mountain Rifle Kit, which is good for late 18th century into the first quarter of the 19th century and then also a Colonial Long Rifle Kit that is good for the 1760-1770 time period. Um, fit and finish, as well as ease of installation in the actual build, he is by far number one. Uh, you would not be disappointed going that route, and if you have a little bit of skill, you can end up with a very fine flintlock weapon to engage in hunting, shooting, or reenacting. Uh, the final avenue that you can go, I shouldn't say the final, there is one more, but is to pay and have a custom built gun done specifically to what you're looking for. Now that is going to be the upper tier as far as expense goes. A custom made firearm typically runs $2,500 to $5,000, so you are going to have to pay up for it. But the age old saying, you do get what you pay for and it would be an heirloom piece that you could uh, pass down through the family and uh, just make sure that you go with a reputable builder someone that's uh, known to do good quality work and uh, you would not be disappointed going that route so long as you don't mind paying the uh, extra premium price there. One last way you can do it is of course to buy a used firearm and any of those uh, 
avenues that I've mentioned, uh, you're going to have firearms that turn up used from those. So, you know, used Petersoles, India Imports, even semi-custom and fully custom guns do come on the market. Obviously, it's just like cars. People are looking to downsize or go a different way, so these things come up for sale. So look on the uh, Contemporary Long Rifle Association's website, also the various gun broker websites, and you might be surprised you can find just what you're looking for there. If you're not well versed in what a flintlock firearm should be in order to be good quality, you know, talk to somebody who knows, go to a muzzleloading supply shop, they can talk you through it about what you need in a flintlock because they a uh, cheap flintlock, especially w in terms of the lock, it's really the uh, recipe for a lot of hassle and frustration if you're new to muzzleloading because you need a quality lock in order for the gun to work properly. A lot of other things need to be right, but that, if you don't understand that, talk to someone that knows and they can uh, guide you through the process. Alright, so let's say you have acquired your flintlock rifle or smoothbore, military musket, whatever appeals to you, and the next thing you're going to have to do is accouter it in order to be able to load it and clean it. Now myself, I'm sort of a traditionalist at heart, so I like to shoot out of the pouch, as it's called, so I've got my horn, my accouterments for basic maintenance to load and fire, and my shooting bag that I wear on my uh, hip here. Now, if you're new to it, you can, you know, of course, go on eBay or Amazon and get the uh, 1995 special as far as a powder horn or a shooting bag, and uh, that will work fine. You know, it's not going to be on the same level as obviously the period correct handmade stuff, but that will get you in the game. And if you get a horn that is airtight, watertight, spark proof, it'll do the job. And if you have a shooting bag or pouch that holds your necessary accoutrements, you know, you're up and running. Now, I would recommend that if you care at all about the historical aspect of it, and most guys that get into traditional flintlock shooting that appeals to them, to wait and buy a set of accoutrements that is going to be in the correct time period and made out of the correct materials that would have been available. You'll save yourself money in the long run because almost everybody starts off thinking, well, I just want to get up and shooting and this looks like it'll work, so you buy it and then a little ways down the road you find out, well, that's not really correct and you have to get rid of it. So do yourself a favor, be patient, do your research, again, ask the same questions. What am I going to be doing with this firearm? and what specific time period am I going for and match your accoutrements to that. Um, you could go to one of the many 18th century artisan show and pick this stuff up. Um, a lot of high quality makers out there in the realm of powder horns and shooting bags and if you pay the money to have a quality handmade period correct piece you will not be disappointed. Just like the gun, it will be an heirloom piece that you can get lots of use out of and enjoyment and pass it on. So this is my own personal powder horn. This is one that I made a while back and of course doing it yourself that is always an option. Um, if you have a little bit of skill you can knock this stuff out. Don't be afraid to talk to a maker. Um, most are very happy to guide you through the process. There's a lot of instructional videos uh, of course on YouTube, instructional books that show you how to make this stuff. But this is one that I made about 10 years ago for myself. Uh, it is an early style. This one was copied from one that was made in 1746 and that is known because the date was inscribed on it by the maker. But uh, early horn, one thing, if you get an earlier horn, 1740s, 1750s, then you can use it at say Revolutionary War events or later um, and have no problem. If you get one that, let's say, it's styled and built for the War of 1812, well, that's not really what you're looking for if you want to partake in French and Indian War or Revolutionary War events. So it pays to uh, perhaps go with the earlier styling if you want sort of a crossover. But uh, again, early horn that I made myself has a finger woven hemp strap on it. Uh, most people agree that the carrying method for powder horns in the 1740-1750 time period was on a separate strap as opposed to being hooked to the shooting bag. The earlier depictions tend to have them off of a secondary strap, so that's why I go with that. Uh, also, 
I have my measure hanging from my horn. This is a carved antler tip measure that is matched to my rifle and will throw the appropriate amount of uh, black powder when I need it. But uh, again, I would recommend that you go with a higher end horn. Of course, budget will dictate that, but wait, save your money, get one from a reputable maker that matches the time period you're going for or invest in some tools and you can do it yourself. But that's my uh, basic powder horn. Make sure you have a good tight fitting stopper it's going to keep water and debris and of course sparks out of the horn so you don't have a catastrophic detonation. Okay, this is my shooting bag that I'm currently using with my rifle. And I picked this one up from a company called Black Powder Pouches. Larry runs that store over there. A phenomenal leather worker and bag maker. You can find him on Facebook, Black Powder Pouches and one of the best in the business, one of many. There's lots of guys that really know their stuff. If you get into the period correct bags, Larry is one of the best. Um, this particular one is fashioned after an early model and for 18th century bags, they tend to be rather plain and small. The ones that exist today that are thought to have been made during 18th century, they tend to follow those two things, relatively small, and plain. Not that I'm sure there weren't some larger, more fancy ones done for, you know, those of a aristocratic background, but for the average guy, plain and small. Um, this one has been made, as I said, out of cowhide. It's a single compartment pouch. It does have a little interior pocket where you can put uh, all the little things that tend to get lost in a bag. It's got a uh, cowhide strap with an adjustable hand forged buckle on there, my own manufacturer. And uh, that does everything I need it to do when out in the woods. I've used this bag at reenactments for target shooting, treks through the woods, works great. Um, does not have to be fancy, again. Um, and it's one of those things that if you go ahead and have a craftsman build it, you're not going to be disappointed and it's an heirloom quality piece. So again, my recommendation is, is that you go ahead and wait, be patient, do your research, don't acquire the cheap bottom of the barrel stuff if you care at all about the historical background to match your particular firearm and uh, you won't be disappointed. Having a, a craftsman with a good reputation that understands what well made and period correct means and if you acquire a bag, a horn, a set of accoutrements that way, in the long run, you're going to be very happy and you're going to get lots of years of fun and use and enjoyment out of it. Well, that's going to end it for part one. Probably going to have multi videos covering this subject because there's a lot that I want to unveil here. On the next subject, the basic loading, shooting, and maintaining of a firearm, things that you'll need to get if you're new to this and then we'll go ahead and cover the loading, shooting, and cleaning in subsequent videos to come. So thank you so much for tuning in everybody. We really appreciate it. The channel is growing. We're over 2,000 subscribers now, so thank you. Really, really appreciate that, and we're looking forward to making more here on down the road. Until next time, take care.